Welcome to the top 10 at 10. Today is June the 2nd, 2014, and these are the top 10 stories. Story number 10, Cuomo explains the limits of his WFP alliance, Workers' Family Party Alliance. This is big news over the weekend at a sort of disputed convention in which Cuomo ultimately prevailed, but there were questions about why he should, given his <laughs> the fact that he's a very right-wing Democrat. Uh, at a parade in Manhattan this morning, in his first appearance in securing the support of the Progressive Working Families Party in exchange for expressing support for its platform, Governor Andrew Cuomo said there were limits to that support. Cuomo, who indicated he'd back the party's goals of helping Democrats take back the state Senate and allowing localities to raise a minimum wage, downplayed the boos and heckling he received in absentia this weekend at the convention of the Working Families Party, whose union and progressive members have long grumbled about Cuomo's fiscally conservative policies and working relationship with Republicans. Quote, it's very simple. At these political conventions, you either win or you lose, uh, and I won, and I'm very happy to have their support, he said. Cuomo refer, referred to the Democratic Party as a, quote, big tent in which, quote, everybody has a voice and everybody wants to use it. Cuomo added at the end of the day, I won the endorsement, and that's what, what's really relevant. In a video showed at the WFP convention last night, Cuomo expressed support for a number of key progressive initiatives, like allowing municipalities to raise their minimum wage, an issue he balked at previously. When I asked him what changed, Cuomo said the issue was actually more nuanced than how it is, was being presented. No, I oppose municipalities being able to set their own wage. I did, and I do. When I pressed him about the video shown last night, Cuomo said that the change in the minimum wage he supports would be governed by a formula, which means it would be capped and regulated throughout the state. Um, so, also, NY, uh, New York One's Courtney Gross asked Cuomo to elaborate on his plans to help Democrats take control of the state Senate. Well, first, let's take a little bit of context here, right? Cuomo replied, this is about electing people who support an agenda. I, will, I also will oppose Democrats who will oppose things that I've tried to pass. Wow. So um, he basically <laughs> he agreed to two things. He said he was going to help the minimum wage and he was going to help elect Democrats throughout the state. And now he's saying, well, maybe we'll cap the minimum wage, and no, I won't help Democrats throughout the state. So <laughs> basically the two things he agreed on to get the nomination, he's now very lukewarm or in some cases openly disputing. Jeez. Story number nine. Uh, this, is, uh, this is from Friday. I didn't – I guess this is part of a book Ken Vogel's doing over at Politico. Uh, Big Money, the Koch brothers, and me. Here's what happens when you try to cover the new oligarchs of American politics. Um, you have the you now have the potential of 200 people deciding who ends up being elected president every single time. Obama told a group in response to questions about the 2010 Supreme Court ruling in a case called Citizens United, which gutted campaign finance restrictions. Unless things change dramatically, Obama predicted I will be the last presidential candidate who could win the way I won, which was coming out without a lot of special interest support, without a handful of big corporate sponsors, supporters, who were able to mobilize and had the time and space to mobilize grassroots effort. Um, of course, the richest Americans have always used their fortunes to try to tilt the nation's political landscape to their liking. The robber baron spent unknown millions financing William McKinley's uh, 1896 pres uh, presidential run, uh, insurance magnates uh, W. Clement Stone invested $4.8 million helping Richard Nixon win the White House twice. In a billionaire currency trader, George Soros spent $27 million trying to elect John Kerry. Okay. I guess it's sort of a breakdown. I mean, this is a four-part piece. I can't go into all of it, but I think he's – he's yeah, here it is. Kenneth Vogel is chief investigative reporter for Politico and author of the forthcoming – Big money, $2.5 billion, one suspicious vehicle, and a pimp on the trail of the ultra-rich hijacking American politics. So apparently Ken Vogel's uh, coming out with a book. It's going to feature the Koch brothers and others. So I guess look for that. Story number eight. Um, this is from the Los Angeles Times. LAPD adds drones to Arsenal, says they'll be used sparingly. 
Um, the Los Angeles Police Department has acquired some eyes in the sky. On Friday, the department announced that it had acquired two, quote, unmanned aerial vehicles as gifts from the Seattle Police Department. The, the Dragon, uh, Dragon Flyer X-6 aircraft, which resemble small helicopters, are each about three feet wide and equipped with a camera, video camera, and infrared night vision capabilities. In making the announcement, however, department officials were at pains to make it clear the LAPD doesn't intend to use the new hardware to keep watch from above over an unsuspecting public. <laughs> oh, come on. Does anybody believe this shit? Of course they're going to... We're just getting, we're not going to use them? Uh, narrow and prescribed use is oh, bullshit. All right, I'll just go to one. Story number seven. Uh, this is from Pando Daily, Gary Breacher over there, the war nerd. Uh, what's happening in eastern Ukraine is very simple, rational, and straightforward. Um, what's happening in eastern Ukraine is very simple, rational, and straightforward. Russia has what it wanted. Crimea, a Russian-majority peninsula with better beaches than the rest of Russia put together. A Russian majority and a geography so eminently defensible that all you have to do is look at it on a map and it screams, Secede! What's going on in eastern Ukraine, a very different Russian-majority region, is a sideshow as far as Putin and his schemers are concerned. This sideshow has two audiences. The first, as Mark Ames explained in his article, Sorry America, Ukraine isn't all about you, is a domestic one. Russia's silent majority, as Ames explained, Putin has used violence to keep that silent majority in an angry national mood. The other audience is Putin's colleagues in power. In Kiev, Brussels, and Washington, Russia has already managed to shift the focus of international attention from Crimea which Russia really wanted and now possesses to eastern Ukraine. Crimea has become a classic fait accompli, the goal of this kind of old school great power game. Ukraine has been forced to give up any pressure on Crimea, whether military or political, in order to put out the ethnic Russian insurgency in the east. This is a real grassroots ethnic uprising born out of long-standing resentment of Ukrainian attempts to enforce a vindictive petty form of Ukrainian Nationalism, full of sentimentality about the wide grasslands and little Ukraine-speaking villages on eastern Ukraine, which is urban, Russian, and industrial. After Crimea showed or seemed to show how easy it was to secede from the vindictive Ukrainian regime and rejoin Russia, ethnic Russians in Donetsk, Slovansk, and other eastern cities uh, naturally attempted to duplicate the quick, easy separation Crimea accomplished. Uh, this didn't happen because... Putin infiltrated the ranks of the Eastern Ukrainian Russian militias. We're seeing ridiculous stories to that effect, like one in the New York Times. Yeah, the New York Times has really fallen down the story. There's been a lot of falling down on the Western press, but I think the overall analysis here is that basically this is, you know, East Putin, the, the situation is Putin has gotten what he wanted, which was Crimea. He'll be able to influence Kiev with gas prices. And he'll be able to keep a sort of gaping, a bleeding wound open in East Ukraine, not, but not actually intervening. So uh, it's cynical, but it's rational. It's not crazy. Remember that meme? It's crazy. He doesn't know he's crazy. I guess he's not too crazy. Story number six. This is from Torrent Freak. Pirate Bay co-founder Peter Sund arrested in Sweden. Peter Sund was arrested today in a police raid in southern Sweden. The Pirate Bay co-founder was wanted by Interpol as he had yet to serve prison time for his involvement with the site. Sund's arrest comes exactly eight years after the police raided the Pirate Bay servers, which marked the start of the criminal prosecution against the site's founders. Former Pirate Bay spokesman and co-founder Peter Sund was arrested today in a rural area near Malum, Sweden. Sund was wanted, for, wanted by Interpol for more than two years ever since... The sentence for his role in the Pirate Bay website was made final. He was living in Berlin for quite some time, but still had family ties in Sweden, which he visited occasionally. Um, whilst details are scarce at the moment, the Swedish newspaper Expressen reports that the arrest had been confirmed. Sun's prison sentence was made final in 2012 after Sweden's Supreme Court announced its decision not to grant leave to appeal in a long-running criminal case. Huh. Okay, so he was arrested. I guess this is still about uh, this, um, I guess, intellectual property theft is the theory. Story number five. Um, Comcast CEO Brian Roberts opens his mouth and inserts foot. 
Uh, oh, this was hilarious. The Comcast CEO uh, basically said Comcast was like uh, the post office. At a recent conference, Comcast CEO Brian Roberts rationalized charging Netflix to deliver content by comparing Comcast to the post office, saying that Netflix pays to mail DVDs to its customers but now expects to be able to deliver the same content over the Internet for free. He forgot to mention that the post office does not charge recipients for those DVDs. But it's even more important because he doesn't want to be – Comcast has been fighting tooth and nail behind the scenes and publicly to prevent being classified as a common carrier, but they – just compared themselves to the post office, which is the definition of a common carrier. So uh, the issue of infrastructure investment, and it is in our collective interest for that investment to be made. Wow. So um, I just, I'm amazed he did that. I guess he didn't realize what he was saying, which was he was making a very strong argument for net neutrality. Good times. Story number four. Uh, it's from Salon. Chris Christie quietly implodes. Why his big accomplishments have fallen to pieces. Yeah, I mean, this is a point I think a lot of people have made. I'm glad to see Salon making it. Uh, this is, this. Is, I mean, forget Bridgegate for a second. Chris Christie is in the middle of six, this is the sixth downgrade of U.S., uh, US New Jersey um, financial notes. So his bonds have been downgraded six times. He's got his... The economy sucks. It's got one of the worst, 48th in the country in private sector job creation. He's now reneged on a pension deal he made. It's his deal. He has to renege on that and skip a pension payment, which makes him even more fiscally irresponsible. Um, he's also in, under investigation for this. Uh, well, he was not under investigation for Bridgegate, under investigation for... Um, Hoboken and Sandy Aid, which is still a problem. And now he's got a, a scandal with pay-to-play pensions uh, that Pando Daily's David Sirota exposed. There's also an, a civil suit with Ben Berlin, a former prosecutor who was fired. By the way, that's actually moving forward. So that has not been stymied. So I, it's just, I mean, there's a lot going on here. He's, he's really a problem. I think, I think he's done. The minute people understand what's going on, he's done. But that could be a while, so I guess we'll just stay tuned. But Chris Christie is just, I mean, all the conservative issues he sucks on, and then all the moderate, middle-of-the-road fiscal responsibility issues he sucks on. So <laughs> what's the appeal? Who's the audience? Who is the constituency? Story number three, this is from Reuters. Russia's Gazprom gives Kiev extension into next week. In gas dispute, Russia's Gazprom gave Ukraine on Monday an extension into next week to resolve a gas price dispute at the heart of the two countries' confrontation a day before Moscow was due to switch off the gas unless Kiev paid in advance. The argument over prices for natural gas has quietly simmered in the background, even as the two countries have squared off over Moscow's seizure of Ukraine's Crimea Peninsula and over a pro-Russian rebel uprising in eastern Ukraine. Since a pro-Moscow president was toppled in Ukraine in February, Russia has demanded a sharp increase in price. Ukraine pays for gas. Kiev said it cannot afford it and wants to pay a discounted price, which it negotiated in the past. While that dispute is going on, Gazprom has continued billing Kiev at a higher rate. It says Ukraine already owes it more than $5 billion on unpaid bills and is running up more than debt at a rate of more than $1 billion per month. Hmm. Okay, so Moscow had previously threatened to switch off Ukraine's gas as soon as this Tuesday, unless it began paying up front for supplies, a measure that could potentially also have also have also hit European supplies shipped through Ukrainian pipes. But after Kiev paid some of its gas debt, Gazprom announced a six-day extension. Oh boy. Story number two, Amazon's scorched earth campaign while the internet giant started a war. Um, Here's what monopoly power means. If you're Amazon, you can ignore the public relation hits that come from blistering front page stories in the New York Times and stinging opinion pieces and continue blithely about your business. So what if the heavy-handed tactics Amazon has deployed in its dispute with the publishing conglomerate Lombard Hatchet, delaying delivery of Hatchet titles include offerings by Stephen Colbert and Malcolm Gladwell, eliminating pre-order buy buttons, hiking the prices of Hatchet eBooks, has incited a storm of outrage. Amazon doesn't care. 
yeah, they're they're going to jack up prices with the Amazon has historically been extraordinarily sensitive to bad press, lest it run the risk of encouraging consumers of its services to think twice about the online giant. Everything Jeff Bezos does, as the silly story goes, puts the customer front and center. So when Amazon says, as it did in a press release this week, detailing its side of the business dispute with Hatchet, that we regret the inconvenience, we're suddenly in new, uncharted, alien territory. I guess. Amazon even advised prospective book buyers to seek better service from its competitors. So this is they're basically dominating they're they're sort of beginning their domination of the publishing industry, which was inevitable. That's what happens when you get monopoly control. You start using it. <laughs> People with power tend to use power. Newsflash. Story number one from Fire Dog Lake, yours truly. Uh, prisoner swap of American POW for Taliban Gitmo detainees causes controversy. On Saturday, Sergeant Bo Bergdahl was released by the Taliban as part of a deal that saw five detainees from the Guantanamo Bay detention facility released in exchange. Bergdahl was captured by Taliban fighters in 2009 under disputed circumstances. He claims he fell behind on the patrol. The Taliban claimed he was drunk. And others in his unit claim he was a deserter. Regardless of how Bergdahl was captured, the decision by the Obama administration to exchange Bergdahl for five senior Taliban commanders was not well, well received by Republicans in Congress, who claimed the Obama administration negotiated with terrorists and did not consult Congress. Before releasing the prisoners from Gitmo, the focus of the controversy has drifted in some circles to Bergdahl himself and whether or not he was a deserter, as some in his unit had claimed. Namely, that he became disillusioned with the U.S. war in Afghanistan and walked off base. There is evidence that Bergdahl was disgusted with the war, though not any as of yet that he was a deserter. Bergdahl was sent to Germany to be treated for unspecified medical problems, where he will also be debriefed by Pentagon officials. Defense Secretary Hagel noted one of the reasons the prisoner swap was completed at this time were concerns about Bergdahl's health. The prisoner swap for Bo Bergdahl, uh, Bergdahl may serve as a mark marker for the end of major U.S. operations in Afghanistan and the beginning of accepting Taliban influence. It also coincidentally knocked the VA scandal off the front page, a scandal that forced retired General Eric Shinseki to resign as head of the VA on Friday. It's all a coincidence. And that is the top 10 at 10. If you have a story you'd like me to feature the top 10 at 10, please tweet me at Dan S. Wright. Be sure to read all the stories at FireDogRate.com. Thanks for watching. See you later.